What is up everyone, Barricade here, and today I'm bringing you guys episode 10 of Gears of War lore. You guys are probably kind of surprised that I'm making this uh, so soon after episode 9. I usually take a while before I even make another episode of Gears of War lore, but this is actually an episode I've been wanting to do for a long time. This is a story, you know, of the, the Santiago family that I've always wanted to do, but I, I don't know, I just always kind of like stalled on it because this will take a lot of time this is going to be a long episode so if you're you know if you're sitting down or something and you really want to watch this all the way through you know get comfortable because this episode is going to be at least 17 minutes long but anyways to start off the santiago family great family they always you know santiago family if you don't know who it is it's obviously dom and his older brother carlos and you know his you know his family basically and just to start off from the beginning um, Dominic Santiago obviously is the son of Eduardo and Eva Santiago. They're basically, you know, they were just a normal family, nothing, you know, too crazy or just, uh, his father was once a cog and he, you know, in his later years, he was basically just like a mechanic for cars, you know, he just fixed them and did all that stuff. He's just, you know, just a mechanic. And his older brother, Carlos, was just a you know normal guy went to school but he always wanted to be a gear he wanted to do what his dad did he wanted to do you know his it was kind of like a family thing you know that they were all cogs and stuff so i don't think dom was very you know into the idea like he wanted to but he, i think carlos was obviously more enthusiastic about it but you know the history of carlos santiago is the first thing i'm going to start off is he met uh marcus when they were very young, I'm pretty sure they were around 11 years old, if not 11 years old. And when he first met Marcus, Marcus was kind of like a loner, kind of like, you know, you, if you've played the games, you obviously know what type of person he is. He's very quiet, doesn't really talk to anyone, very serious guy. And he was like that even when he was a child. He was the very quiet, rich kid, because I don't know if you knew this about Marcus, but he comes from a very wealthy family. He, you know, his family had a mansion crazy garden etc and you know he went to school middle school and you know he was kind of picked on and kind of like people a lot of the other kids kind of didn't like him because he was kind of seen as the spoiled rich kid and even though he was rich he didn't act like a spoiled kid he didn't act like those people that thought he was better than others and right away Carlos Santiago noticed this in him you know he saw him he saw him kind of like as a mysterious kid very quiet didn't do you know you know anything to anyone very serious kid right away you know he he you know came up to Marcus and you know tried to talk to him and actually right here in the book right here let me see if I can find the page is uh he met him like they had a class together to start off and he you know he just saw him in his class and he was just like okay you know this kid's new whatever rich kid but then he saw him alone in you know the lunch you know, they're eating lunch or whatever. He, you know, he felt bad because no one wanted to sit next to him. No one sat, sat next to Marcus. And he was all alone. So, Carlos, right here it says, right here it says, At lunch, Carlos kept an eye on Marcus, just in case. The reason why he did this was because he felt worried. Because he knew he was the rich kid. And he knew that, you know, that people were going to probably pick on him or something. Uh, nobody sat next to him at the long uh, refectory table. They just watched him. He never said a word. Eventually, Carlos couldn't stand it any longer. Picked up his plate and moved to sit beside him. I'm Carlos Santiago, he said. What's behind the wall around your house? The wall the wall on All Fathers Avenue. It's basically like a, you know, he had a huge wall, as, you know, and everyone wanted to know what was behind it. Orchard, Marcus said, not meeting his eyes. Cool, Carlos nodded approvingly. Where did you go to a school before? Private tutor. And, you know, that explained a lot. And Mar Marcus was just, you know, very, you know, kind of just quiet. You know, he didn't seem to be very, you know, he wasn't, as the book it says right here, he wasn't very chatty. He's just very, you know, quiet kid. And there were some bullies that, you know, just didn't like him right away. And they just wanted to, meet, you know, just pick on him right away. And, you know, this, these kids go up to him and they, you know, this kid named Joshua and his brother Roland. You know, I have the book right here. And he goes up to them and says, uh, Joshua says, um, so he thinks he's too good for us. And he, that could have meant Carlos or Marcus or both. 
Carlos knew he could handle himself in a fight, so he decided to set Joshua straight from the start. He found himself pinching in to defend Marcus Emili just like he did for Dom. He's okay. Leave him alone. You're soaking up to him because he's rich, Joshua sneered. Snob, you're an ass-kissing snob, Santiago. And you're a moron. Leave him alone, the, uh, Carlos said. And, you know, he just kind of, like, kept picking on Marcus. And then it led to, like, a fight. It led to a fight. Like, they were playing thrash ball. And it basically, you know, they're kind of just taking it out on each other. You know, if you you know if you've ever played sports, you know, if you don't like the kid, you're gonna start trying to kick his ass while you're playing sports. And while they're playing sports, you know, the kid was trying to you know beat up Carlos. And then it led to a fight. It led to a fight outside. You know, he tried to leave kind of fast, so you know the kid wouldn't uh, you know try to pick a fight with him. Uh, you know, out of the gym. You know, he he was the kid was kind of waiting for him. So let's see right here in the book, it says, uh, Oh, he left first anyway, just to make sure that the coast was clear. It wasn't. In the shade of the uh, portico outside, Joshua and Roland Curson waited, hands thrust in his pockets with one of their buddies. Carlos straightened up and stood his ground. You think you're really hard, don't you, Santiago? Joshua said. He let his arms hang on his sides. Carlos knew what was coming. You're always taking over and telling us what to do. And what are you going? And then Carlos says, "And what are you going to do about it?" This Joshua said. And then they start, you know, scrapping or whatever. And you know, he's fighting them for a while, and he's fighting, you know, that kid. And out of nowhere, he feels someone grab him from behind. He car you know, someone grab Carlos. And then he says, "Uh, you know, oh crap, you know, I can't take two of them, can I? Mom's going to kill me if I if I come home and mess, you know, messed up again." But it wasn't it wasn't Roland's brother, and I mean it wasn't Roland. You know, Joshua's brother or his friend, it was another guy. It was Marcus. And, you know, he jumped into the fight and he stomped him. He kicked his ass. He jumped on top of him. You know, he gave him a punch that sent that kid flying. And that kid was just done, just with that punch. And Carlos was, like, surprised because Marcus, first of all, is a quiet kid. And, you know, he's kind of scrawny and little. So he didn't look like the type of kid that would be able to, you know, deck someone really hard. And, you know, Carlos was just like, whoa. And then and then after that, they just became friends. And, you know, Marcus, you know, invited Carlos to his house. They went, you know, hung out. And uh, Carlos immediately realized the type of family Mar uh, Marcus had, which is unfortunately Marcus's family was very secretive. They didn't really spend too much time going to drink some water because I'm thirsty. Ugh. Anyways, you know, they... Uh, very to themselves. His parents weren't, you know, they really there. They were kind of just like, here, play with this, and we're going to go work type of family. And, you know, Carlos immediately saw this, and, you know, he's kind of trying to be there for him, you know, be a brother. One day when, if you've seen my other episodes about, you know, Marcus's mother, you know, you'll, you'll know that, you know, his mother disappeared. And when she disappeared, you know, Marcus was obviously devastated. Yeah, he wasn't really, like... He didn't get to spend too much time with his parents, but he still loved his mom like crazy. You know, he always cared about it. She was like his number one person in the world when he was little. When she disappeared, he flipped, you know, of course, you know, a little kid losing your mom. He, you know, he was freaked out and, you know, he was hanging out with Carlos and Dom at their house. You know, he's, he was just, you know, broken, you know, poor kid, you know. Freaking, you know, Carlos, no, Dom asks his Carlos, what are we going to do? You know, what, you know, what are we going to do for this guy? You know, his mom is gone. What are we going to do? And um, uh, Carlos says, we're going to be brothers to him. We're going to be there for him because that's what f friends do. That's what brothers do. And ever since then, that's when that you know whole bond with uh, Marcus and, Do and uh, Dom and Carlos kind of like made, you know, permanent. You know, they became really close and they were brothers. You know, M uh, Marcus kind of had it in his little head that he was a uh, part of the Santiago family. Like he was their third child or something. You know, they were they were very close. That was what made, you know, Carlos's death really bad because Carlos, Marcus cared about Carlos like the same he cared, same way he cared about Dom. You know, when Carlos died, it was devastating to him. Poor dude, you know, he's like his brother. And poor Dom, he's, it's his actual brother. It was just very, very, you know, saddening for, for all of them. After, you know, after all that, you know, they just kind of, you know, just moved on, you know, the locusts came out, etc. That's it for Carlos. I'm gonna talk about uh, um, now. I'm gonna talk about uh, Dom and Maria. You know their family. You know Dom met Maria when he was young. He he saw her, 
when they were little kids. She was the girl next door, and he like immediately fell in love with her. He was just like, oh my god, you know, kind of like you know the original Spider-Man movies. You know, he sees her and he's little a uh, little boy, and he's just like you know always in love with her. Well, dummy, when they're 16 years old, you know they kind of got you know I guess the best way to put it is intimate. Idiot wasn't work wearing protection. They were only 16. Got her pregnant when they were 16. He didn't know what to do, you know what I mean? Young kid, 16-year-old kid, got his girl, 16-year-old girlfriend pregnant. He's just like, oh my god, you know, what the hell am I going to do? You know, he's freaked out, he didn't know what to do. And the good thing about Dom is he's a good guy. And that's actually one of the reasons why he's my favorite character. He's a good guy. He knew he messed up, got his girlfriend pregnant, and he shouldn't even have been doing that at 16. But he made up for it. And what he did was he immediately told himself, I'm joining the COG, and I'm supporting my family. And that's what he did. He told, you know, his, uh, you know, future uh, parents-in-law, whatever you want to call it, you know, that he, he, their Mr. and Mrs. Flores, Maria Flores, that was their, you know, real name, full name. You know, he told them, you know, I got your daughter pregnant, you know, and they're freaking out, you know, oh my God, you know, you know, they start yelling at him, his dad goes crazy on him, but, uh, Dom's father was there, you know, kind of just ha had him, like, support, you know, watching, make sure, you know, her dad doesn't beat his ass. And, you know, he tells him, you know, I'm, I'm going to support my family. And he did, you know, he joined the COG. He dropped out of school when he was, like, 16 and, be, you know, joined the COG. And then that, you know, he was 16, 17, 18 when all that, you know, crazy stuff. When they got the blueprints for the Hammer of Dawn and Carlos died and all that extra crazy stuff happened after, you know, obviously. And the thing that was really crazy was the fact that his son was born a little bit after he became a cog. Obviously, nine months after he became a cog. And then a few years later, he got her pregnant again. But that w that one was, you know, not a big deal because he was making money. He They got married. You know, it was, that one was a good pregnancy. And he, he when he got her pregnant that time, the thing that was really sad was the same night that Carlos died, his daughter Sylvia was born. And, you know, he was just like, oh, you know, in love with her and, you know, all happy, you know, father with his daughter. You know, and it, it, it kind of helped him deal with it, cope with Carlos's death. And that, that was the good thing that, you know, that she was born and he, you know, yeah, he lost his brother, but, you know, here's his daughter. You know, so that was a good thing. That was the really good thing about that. Shortly after all that, boom, E-Day. And the thing that was really sad was the they just barely moved into a new house. If you watch my E-Day episode, I'm going to try to keep it short because I talked about it more in the E-Day episode. You know, Gears of War lore. You know, he just moved into a new house. And his, you know, if you remember in the game, in Gears 2, when he's remembering, she's like, oh, the kids are at my mother's, so we got the day to ourselves. And that happened to be freaking E-Day. E-Day happened. The locust came out, unfortunately, near where her parents lived with their kids, and they killed her kids. Their kids, you know, they killed her family, her her parents, her her kids, their kids. Because of this, she was very, you know, devastated. Poor Maria, she was very devastated. You know, you take away the kid, you take away kids from a mother, and you know, they they don't got nothing. And she she was very you know, extremely devastated, crying all the time. Dom was leaving to go fight the locust. She's always worried that Dom's going to die. You know, every, when he came home to visit her, when he would get, you know, time for leave or whatever, he would go visit her and she would be just like puffy-dyed. Her eyes would just be red, you know, from crying all the time. And she, she was very, very devastated. And you can't blame her because, yeah, Mark, I mean, yeah, Dom was out fighting, but that kept him, you know, distracted. You know, gave him kind of a good feeling because he's killing these motherfuckers that killed his kids. She's stuck at home, nothing to do. Her kids are dead. You know, she she had a really bad experience with it, and she would even she kind of lost it a little bit. She would go out looking for them, and she would say, you know, oh, I saw my kids, I saw my kids. You know, they're there. You know, I I saw them. They're they're lost. I I can go get them. You know, they had to tell her. You know, your kids are dead, Maria. You know. It was very sad because she she went really kind of mental almost because of it, and then I don't I don't think they ever really said the day she left. I don't remember reading it in the book where they sh the day she left, but she did leave, and she she just left them without anything, no 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 nothing. She's gone because she couldn't deal with it anymore. She couldn't deal with being with knowing that Dom is always out there that she doesn't have her family no more. She needed something new, I guess. You know, I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying it's a good thing because she should have stayed with Dom, in my opinion. Poor dude searched for her for 10 years just to find her the way she was. 
poor chick. You know what I mean? You kind of can't blame her in a way. And, you know, she, she just left because she couldn't deal with it. it was, she was done. The last thing I want to talk about real quick before this episode's done. The one thing I always liked about Dom was because when he, at the end of the Pendulum Wars, he risked his life to save a bunch of people on a boat. And when he did this, they gave him an Embry Star. You know, it was worth a lot of money. He, you know, high standard, high ranking dude. You know, he got really up there in the cog. When Marcus got imprisoned 10 years after E-Day, when he, you know, didn't listen to his orders and basically got himself in prison because, you know, he cost a lot of people's lives, etc. I actually did an episode of that, so go check that out too. But anyways, when he was in prison, you know, to testify against it, you know, to try to... Marcus was basically found guilty, prison, done. No, you know, there was nothing left. But Dom tried to go for retrials, tried to get, you know, to try to testify for Marcus, try to do whatever he could to get Marcus out of there. And he needed the money to do these trials, the retrials, so he sold his Embry Star. He didn't care. You know, I, yeah, this is a freaking piece of metal that says I'm a good soldier, but what does it matter if my buddy's in jail? I'm pretty sure that's what he was thinking. Sold it, it kept going and going and going, but of course they, they never listened to him. And because of the fact that he was defending basically like a cog reject, a bad person in their eyes, it ruined his rank. You know, he had a high rank, he was up there, and they busted him, busted him. Every time he tried to do it, they just dropped him because they said, you know, this guy's a traitor because he's defending this other traitor. So he kind of just, you know, kind of fell, you know, kind of just screwed him over. But he didn't care. Marcus's brother, and that's what he did it for. And that's why uh, Dom will always be my favorite character because he's a good guy. And he didn't give a shit about himself. He didn't care about what happened to him. And that's why he sacrificed himself at the end of Gears 3 for Marcus. Because all he cared about was his brother. But anyways. <laughs> I ran out of time here. If you guys like this episode. Please definitely like and subscribe. I'm going to do more of these. And I'm trying to get more. You know as much videos as I can out. But yeah definitely tell me what you guys think. You know about the Santiago family. And uh, what, you know, what else you guys want to see. In future episodes of Gears of War lore. But anyways, thanks for watching, guys. Definitely hit that like button and subscribe. Thanks for watching, guys.